Hi, uh, this is Ed Jaffe, and welcome back to Jaffe Woodwinds. Uh, today we're in Glendale, California, uh, sunny LA, uh, doing some interviews with some of the great players who've uh, made their names out here in Los Angeles in the concert world as well as in the studio world. And for our first interview out in LA today, I'm so pleased to have uh, magnificent Gary Gray, who has established himself for literally almost half a century now uh, as a preeminent clarinetist playing out here in orchestras and chamber groups uh, in Hollywood studio recordings and recitals as a clarinetist and also as a saxophonist. Gary's also the professor emeritus at UCLA and has turned out many, many wonderful uh, clarinetists for generations. And so, Gary, thank you so much for coming by today. And, oh, it's my and, pleasure. Man, really. And, and yeah. uh, looking forward to learning more about you, uh, <laughs> even as much as you know, I've learned about you over the years. But I, for our listeners, I think this will be very important. Um, mm -hmm. So where did you grow up and how did you start uh, your training? I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, many years ago. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, my father was uh, very interested in uh, jazz. He was a Sinatra lover, and so uh, and my mother's family, uh, her her uh, younger brother, Carl Kreis, played clarinet and saxophone. So I would go over at age 10, 11, and play his instruments when he wasn't there, and he'd come home, and show me more. And then uh, finally, in Indianapolis, there was a little place, a college, uh, where I could study with Rosemary Lang. A lovely lady who again uh, influenced my clarinet playing from her style, and uh, she was before her time. You didn't think of a famous ladies playing the clarinet, but Rosemary. Every week we'd go through the the close book, the my thirds and uh, chords and so on, and she put me at the beginning with the first time I ever played the Mozart concerto. So, um, you know, I, I've been at this a long time, and I, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to mention the people that have influenced me, like Rosemary Lang. W wasn't she also a saxophonist, too? Yes, she well, was, as a matter of fact, she I, was. That's very unusual. I know. And, of course, once I won a scholarship to uh, Interlock, and Keith Stein was up there. That name ring a bell? Sure, and he, he wrote The Art of Clarinet Playing. Another gentleman who... Uh, uh, was so encouraging to me, like Mitchell. There, you know what I mean? It's, it's just something that uh, I've tried to do with my many students for the last couple of years. So uh, you were with Keith Stein, then ultimately you were with, like you said, Mitchell Laurie and yeah. then Robert McGinnis. Yeah, yeah. Right? And they yeah. all gave me something yeah. special. Yeah, and so when you began playing and you found that you really loved clarinet playing, what were your goals? Were, were you thinking about an orchestral career, a solo career? Oh, I mean, no, no, well, not, not, not a solo career. I mean, later on, and I've I didn't I've done you know the Mozart and 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 uh, but but when I first began, I just wanted to get a job in an orchestra, and uh, have a schedule, so I can remember in Kansas City at the end of one season, they would hand us a schedule for the next year. Right. And some of the people would say, "Oh, thank God!" I've got, I said, "Yeah, I'm I, I'm secure. I've passed uh, the the conductor for a year, and we when we're going to continue." Right. So I get to play more interesting repertoire, um, Mozart symphonies, uh, Brahms symphonies, uh, more challenging pieces, Stravinsky pieces. Stravinsky, who makes you uh, practice the clarinet patterns different than any of the other uh, uh, classic and romantic composers. So um, anyway, I just, I've been very fortunate along the way to have these good teachers and then an opportunity to play. And uh, now my students say to me, how do I get a job in orchestra? And then AF of N puts out the thing, you know. Yeah. So I'll see one job on bass clarinet in, in Michigan, uh, Detroit, Symphony or something. So then I, I loan my bass clarinet to uh, the student who's best at, at it. And I say, that's what you're, uh, aim for that. You got a specific goal, there's an opening. Let's see how far you get. So you're gonna go through and play the Grand Canyon Suite with the low E flat. And low C, I mean, you know. Yeah, right. All yeah, the way down and to the, and and, you're, yeah. You're, you're, and I loan my horns out. Yeah, I don't mind. They, I, we have a, a signing sign out sheet at UCLA. I loan my horns and my music, right. and uh, just so I get it back, you know. <laughs> but, but but that was a very different time when you began your orchestral career as compared yeah. to today. Uh, you were in Kansas City and then and the St. Louis. St. Louis. Yeah. And and but shortly thereafter, you ended up coming out. Out here, out west. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the 
uh, motivation for coming Music out Music Academy here? of the West, Mitchell Lurie. I see. I came out with some other uh, Hoosier guys who had gigs, and uh, they said, we're going to California for the summer. And little did I know I'd make the whole rest of my life here. Yeah. I mean, this is where I've lived, and I met my wife, and, and uh, UCLA now has given me so many opportunities to play clarinet and saxophone and, and uh, teach clarinet. So um, yeah. I can say I'm lucky, but I'm not, it's not complete luck. It's not complete luck. I've, I've been able to nurture my own talent and uh, show up on time. I remember one of the first times at Universal, I was working for, for Sandy de Crescent. Do you remember Ring Ring a Bell? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I've never worked for Sandy. I'm from New York, but I, yeah. she is one of the biggest. So there we are playing, here. and then I, I wanna, the, the other clarinetist is late. I'm not going to mention who is named Ralph Williams. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. He was late, and Sandy uh, called him over and said, um, Ralph, I don't think we'll be using you anymore. So there's another lesson. Show up early. Have your read ready. Uh, show respect to the contractor, to the composer. I mean, there's even my last composers that I played for, uh, one was Hans Zimmer. Oh. And he combines electronics with clarinets and everything. And I was having to grip my seat and say, I don't like this music. I don't like it, but of course the check cashed, and, yeah. and uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, but... And then, you, and then you like it a little bit more. I liked it a little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, you know, I can't be that picky. I, I, and I just, I, I'm telling you, uh, if you're a clarinet teacher, uh, you know, be encouraging. Don't just, de McGinnis was so negative, I'm surprised I persisted. But there's a, a medium ground between demanding and also encouraging. And I think that's, that's really what I've tried to achieve. And now I have some students that are, are doing well because of that. I, I, I brought three clarinetists from the Royal College when I did the, the uh, recording. The, the yeah. recording of the yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all doing well. One's first in the LA Opera. One's, you know, Steve, Steve uh, our key is in, you know, just, sure. it just, it just, uh, uh, there's no reason to be discouraging. That won't help you preserve your little domain. That's, that's not the way to think of music making. Right. And um, I, I went to school at Juilliard with one of your students uh, who spoke about you then and has spoken about you all these years since with the greatest uh, accolades, and that's John Brucier. Oh my God, well. You know, John Brucier, talent. E flat player of the Chicago Symphony. John Berussi, and, and a Westwood boy. I was his first teacher and uh, before he went into any schools. And last time he was in town with Chicago Symphony, we got together and he took a picture for Facebook and all that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, but John came very well prepared at Juilliard. He was a, uh, he was a let's see, a freshman when I was a first year grad student. Yeah. And the second year, when he was a sophomore, he won the gig in the Chicago Symphony as first as bass clarinetist. Right, I remember. Be before yeah. he moved over to his uh, assistant. No, he's principal. a big talent. Right, but I mean, the point is, uh, your teaching obviously has proved fruitful for your students. So that this, um, these words of uh, advice to other teachers is yeah. uh, well placed. Well, sure, you you can be strict and still very encouraging, and especially on the E flat and bass clarinet. You know, there's the place where I've got some of my gigs. Interlock and I went up there and uh, played to Logenspiegel. And uh, isn't, now I don't like to play the E flat, to be honest. But I mean, I don't mind. It's, I, when I hear somebody play it beautifully, then. <laughs> right, sure. No, it, no. It, it, but yeah, I understand what you're saying because after a while, that high F sharp yeah, uh, is yeah. a little much. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. stick to Mozart and Brahms. Yeah. So you, you, you early on, uh, after your studies at Indiana, got the jobs in Kansas City and St. Louis, but yeah. then you got out here. How did, and you said that you know, going to the Academy of the West brought you out here, but yeah. how did you get started in the business out here? I think that's a pretty interesting story. Uh, well, it was Mitchell, uh, and I, oh, I was playing a, a show, My Three Sons. The, have you ever heard of that show, Old Show, My Three Sons? You're talking about the Fred McMurray uh, Yeah, show? yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. It was a big I'm hit on TV. Yeah, well, that composer, uh, oh, I'm terrible with names of that early composers. Uh, he 
who heard about me and, and uh, uh, it's just it's interesting if you <laughs> if you treat other people well on their way up or down or whatever you want to call it or just in, in, in it's, it's not necessary to be a, a, a jerk and, try to, <laughs> and uh, try to push people out of the way it doesn't pay off right and I've, I've been called Mr. Nice Guy by some people and, and that's not really true it's not I respect for other people's talents but I'd be glad to audition against them. And you know what I mean? Yeah. So give me the repertoire. So my students, when I see an opening, still now in the F FM, uh, you know, the magazine, I sure. say, okay, it's only, it's bass clarinet and uh, 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 the, uh, there was a symphony in Colorado or in Michigan somewhere, you know, it's part-time orchestra. Right. And I said, um, try for it. You never know. Yeah. And you'll learn from that going in there. Sure. If, you, if you make a mess of the audition, right. you'll, you'll find out. Was I, did I forget to really use my, my uh, stomach muscles? You know, these are, you know, this is where it comes from. So if you really take a deep breath, firm up these muscles, and keep playing, and, and then relax your hands, that's, a, that's the basic thing. We're wind players. Right, and it's an athletic activity. It is. It's the other thing. That's right. Right. You can't stay up uh, cavorting all night and uh, <laughs> not taking care of your, your, your physical uh, ability. Right. And uh, now there is an interesting story I think I, I've known about for a number of years and see if it's true that Frank Sinatra actually had a huge uh, degree to do with your success. Oh, yes, in, he did. Listen, get it go. Can you share that story with us? Well, he uh, uh, lived in Bel Air, and he, uh, <laughs> he knew about UCLA, and we were still just a department, not a big Herb Alpert School of Music or anything. So um, he came over, and uh, I remember he heard three or four of us play for the award, and it was a vocalist, uh, myself and a pianist, heard me play and chatted with me and said, what do you want to do, kid? So since I was in my late 20s, whatever. I said, I'd like to play for the movies and all that. He says, well, okay. So he went to a contractor at Warner Bros., uh, uh, Kurt Wolf. After, wow. And said, y you remember, remember that name? Sure. It's and a said, his, and historic. And yeah. <laughs> and he said, hire this kid. That's all. And Kurt said, oh, okay. Yes, Mr. Sinatra. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I he mean, had incredible who, who power. Who would do that today? I mean, that's that's a great that, that story. That never can happen again. I right, quite like but the, that. there are a lot of stories about Sinatra like that that you don't hear about. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there's one, not related to music, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Buddy Rich toward the end of his life was you know out in the hospital out here. So I understand, and mm -hmm. the expenses were extraordinary. Yeah, Sinatra picked up the bill. Well, see there. Yeah, he had a good heart. Yeah, yeah. After all of that, the veneer and all of that that you hear, yeah, yeah. deep down, there's look. You can't sing like Sinatra sang without having something deep inside. That's I agree really with you. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can't be a jerk and, and uh, have some of the tender feelings he conveys. Sure. But he was tough. Yeah. Remember, he had the pack. You know, all the old the guys that went around pack, and Dean yeah. Martin and yeah. everybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They all had their own. I still love Dean Martin. So. That was my mother's favorite. She loved Dean Martin. She thought he was. That's called no tension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just kind of, yeah. He was just perfect. Yeah. So now, as your career began in the studios, and you were teaching at UCLA, yeah. uh, you're balancing both careers. Yeah. Now, how, how did you go about doing that? Because that's a lot of time, and a, you, you have to be quite organized, I would think. <sighs> yes, I was. Yeah. At certain times of the day, I practiced, and certain times I rested and. Uh, my present wife has always been a great uh, supporter of my, my uh, Juliet. Right. And uh, so, you know, she's always, ever since we got married, things have focused a little more. Right. Mm -hmm. And and where you, uh, I remember speaking with Stanley Drucker and, yeah. uh, about this, because I, you know, he, uh, in addition to his duties as um, principal in the New York Philharmonic, he would do tons of chamber music outside. Oh, yeah. So I yeah. said, how did you, uh, I remember asking Stanley, how did you, do all this. I mean, being a principal player in a major orchestra, then <laughs> doing all these recordings and doing chamber music. Well, he is. And, a, he was a genius. <laughs> well, he was. But but he also said he only practiced what he was what was coming up in the uh, orchestra. Right. In other words, and of course, what he would do on the side with chamber music. In other mm -hmm. words, he was geared to what he was going to oh, be well, performing. Oh, that was his steady job. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And did you did you take I that found type that in of St. Louis in Kansas City. 
Uh, okay. I didn't. I don't think I ever played a note of chamber music over there that much. I'm trying to think, I just didn't have time. And uh, right, you know, you right. Know. And and then when you got into the Hollywood studios, and you know, in those days, as I understand it, you, know, you came in and just they put the music in front of you. Oh yeah. And it's not like today where the music is sent over yeah, uh, no, the no, computer no, no, and we no, get no. it, you know, to look oh, it here's over. Here's the music two, three, four. Yeah. Right, right on the money. Yeah. And and we didn't have Pro Tools in those days, so no. it was direct to the tape. Uh, and yeah. so they, the pressures on the musicians yeah. uh, coming into a studio session would yeah. have been really to, great uh, yeah. to, to be able to produce first that's take. That's true, but breathe deep, <laughs> you know. And, and remember, nobody was forcing you into this. So you had to be here at 9 a.m. and play perfect and there the music. <laughs> what else did you think it was going to be? I, I would say to myself, see. So, uh, and I didn't expect any favors. I didn't, I didn't, uh, there were some people that would kiss up to, I mean, and they would, excuse me, they would. Um, <laughs> no, use be, the right word. <laughs> they would kiss up to the contractor <laughs> and uh, try to get to know uh, Sandy de Crescent, where does she live? Uh, what part of Woodland Hills is she in? Can I send her presents? Right. <laughs> and I, and I, I never did any of that. And I've told my students, you don't have to do that. Now, let me jump a little bit to it. Yeah. It's another topic. You are also one of the few classical clarinetists, orchestral clarinetists, yeah. who also played saxophone and played saxophone quite well. Yeah. When did your interest in saxophone start? All the way back in high school again with my uncle. Yeah. Carl. Yeah. And who, who, were, who were some of the heroes, the saxophone heroes that you um, gravitated to? Paul, one of my first ones was Paul Desmond. And I, I know I liked Charlie Parker too. I heard about his poor drug habits and all that. But Paul Desmond played so sweet with Dave Brubank that that's my concept of alto. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I would try to get sis, you And know. one of the most beautiful voices on alto saxophone ever. There's no I question. I think so. Yeah. And, and on tenor, because I know you also play tenor, who, who were your influences Stan there? Getz. Stan Getz. Okay. I mean, I liked uh, John Coltrane, but uh, he kind of near the end of his life went off the rails a little bit with his soprano playing and his interesting in the modes. You know, for, <laughs> and he wasn't doing 32 bar uh, song form, and you know, right. you know that. He would, one of right. the pieces he went for a half an hour just on. Yeah. Well, that, that sort of opened up the jazz spectrum, a modal playing and then the free playing. Uh, expanded oh, the thing, yeah. I, and you know it's an acquired taste depending on who you are. <laughs> so I, I, so you're coming from more of the straight ahead yeah, yeah, American songbook, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and the and the sound of mm -hmm. uh, Desmond on alto and Stan Getz on oh, tenor, my. in a way, sort of relates more to the clarinet voice. Of it, course, it, it does. It's, it's yeah. a, so yeah. I can see that connection. Yeah, and and uh, you also. Uh, I think in your teaching duties over the years at UCLA, ran the jazz ensemble there That's as true. well. When it, yeah, yeah. So ha had it, had it, those experiences come about as far well, as directing? Well, I learned to be more uh, on the stage. There's different ways to lead a jazz band. Gary Foster is wonderful. He just counts off and goes to the side. And I, I admire that. I, by the way, I hope you're, you're going to interview Gary. Oh, yeah, Gary's going to... Oh, he's one of my idols. <laughs> he's uh, he's a lot Fisher, of people's we, idols. Yeah, no, he's, a, he's fantastic. And he would just go to the side. I got this bad habit of kind of jumping around. And then I noticed people who didn't know anything about music responded a little more. So I, I, uh, I, I confess, I, I, I kind of did more of my conductor act a little I bit. See. I see. Okay. He would just count off and go off. And I said to him many times, Gary, that's amazing. You're really trusting uh, the, the college he was teaching at. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I, I, I conducted a jazz ensemble in, a, in my university for about 20 plus years. And I never felt confident enough to walk off the stage. And I guess it's the individual, um, you know, how you approach your own yeah, yeah. Kind of playing. I felt, I don't know if it's a control thing, but yeah. I just, I guess I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah so I understand yeah. that vibe also. Uh, <laughs> so uh, now you, a big part of your recording career has been involved in uh, chamber music mm -hmm. as well. When, when did that bug hit? Because you mentioned that when you were in Kansas and St. Louis, you didn't have time for that. No, that's true. Uh, that came about the, uh, once I got out here and started be making a reputation in Hollywood. Uh, I was able to find time to do woodwind quintets and uh, Brahms trio, and I, you know, I always found time. I I I I'd like to be busy. Right. And my wife says to me sometimes, "You want to always be busy," and I said, "Yes, my dear. I you only live once." And right. I, so the support system 
is essential, no matter how talented or successful oh, you are. Oh, of course. You, you need a, a support system Oh, my system God, at home. yes. I, I think so. You know. Whether you're uh, Michelle Zukowski had a, a good husband at home. Right. Boy, can she play. Yeah, Michelle, who was the uh, former principal clarinetist, longtime oh. principal of the L.A. Philharmonic. Yeah, fantastic. And, and, her, and her father, Kalman Block, he was great, too. Yeah, he preceded her. He, well, he was it's a family it, business. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they had a nice thing going there. Yeah. But um, so of all the musics you played, you know, between orchestral music, chamber yeah. music, yeah. recitals, doing studio work, was there one that you felt was the most rewarding of the, the type of scenario that you enjoyed more than the others, if that's possible. I liked them all. I must remember one time uh, I was asked to do the WC Premier Rhapsody, which I, is probably one of my favorite pieces for, for sure. And uh, Joanna Harris, Roy Harris's widow, was still oh, alive. Okay. And she was on our piano faculty. And to raise money sometimes, they would send Joanna and I out. And we'd play for a dinner party or something. And the people would be clanking their dishes. We don't know who they were, but they, they, they were obviously trying to get donations from them. And so we'd start, da, da, de, da, 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 de. Seven minutes. It's, it's a very difficult piece. But I, I got, so we would do it as a pair. And they always got people to respond and, and to give money to UCLA. Interesting, huh? Yeah. So you enjoy those type of scenarios? Oh, yeah. Those, I mean, just, yeah. just the, the piano. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we got some great pianists at, at UCLA now. Yeah. And, uh, well, when you have a great pianist and with the repertoire the clarinet has, oh. it's nirvana. No, you can start over the way before right. notes already went in. Sure. But yet, you, and you've recorded a lot of... Uh, Solo made a lot of solo recordings. Yeah, your it seems to me your choices in your recordings are a little bit uh, unusual. They're not always the standard. Uh, yeah, that, that's, top, true. The, the, that's the, true. The top ten, yeah. let's say. I mean, but that's because uh, Centaur Records would let me do it. Yeah, so you had you a know. company that would yeah, encourage you yeah. to do different uh, yeah. repertoire. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that the latest CD that was a combination of clarinet, you know, jazz, and uh, so. And it's sold very well. Right. You know, so. Right. Now, let me ask you a little bit about the pedagogy that, and yeah. how you approach uh, teaching. Uh, let's say you have an incoming freshman student. Yeah, yeah. What, what are some of the uh, 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 things you talk about with them, first and foremost, from a standpoint uh -huh. of the pedagogy, or the fundamentals of playing the clarinet? Right, right. Uh, well, control technically. Um, this, this Darren that I was mentioning before, he yeah. was very good about... Uh, Organizing the close and the, other, the and, you know scales, thirds, chords. Right. He's willing to put up with that. Some students want to jump over that and you know I want to play the Schumann fantasy piece. I say, well, oh, the notes seem simple, don't they? Dee -da, dee -da, da, 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 da. But you know, uh, it, it's more to it than that. So uh, I, I, I try to get so that uh, some of them get a little too carried away with technique, and that's all they're thinking about then. And then I remind them, no, Mozart, you know, the more and more heart, you know, Brahms trio. I did just that the last year or two. That's one of my favorite trios, clarinet, cello, piano. So when you get a really great cellist, you know, playing with you, it's, I pref almost prefer that to doing a sonata. Yeah. You well, know, then you've got a voice to talk to, and then you've got the piano to to, uh, to inter relate intercede. To. Yeah. And especially when you have the cello and you're playing a clarinet. Yes, exactly. And, and you get into the yeah. meaty part of the uh, yeah, yeah. the horn. It's it's it, it is a special experience. I, I've had yeah. the good fortune of playing that piece a number yeah. of times. So yeah. I know what you're. You have to have a good A and B flat, a double case, one of each, and right. and be ready to do, do you, that. Do you encourage your clarinet majors to not only have obviously the A and B flat clarinet, but yeah. also to purchase an E flat and bass? You, well, of course. You know, uh, I mean, they've, some of them have borrowed my yeah, yeah, other yeah, instruments yeah, right, to, when yeah. the gig comes open. You right. know, but uh, yeah, no, no, they're not going to just get it playing the, the, the clarinet family. Right. It's the, the A and B flat. Yeah, and, and things have changed over the last several uh, decades, uh, maybe even several generations now, uh -huh. where st uh, students can major in bass clarinet right. at certain institutions, and uh, it's it, it's being encouraged because. There are fewer jobs yeah. uh, in, in orchestras that pay a livable wage. So yeah. when those jobs come open, you want to be able to specialize in those uh, the E flat and bass and so right, on. Right, right. And and John Yeh is a great example of oh, someone my. who 
you know, had the bass clarinet to really together, and of course his B flat and A player oh, no, was a, a, he's a master. He's and a then master. he was able to transition mm -hmm. from that to playing uh, associate first with the E flat being a prominent well, part of, of, his, uh, of the. And duty. of course, the final little uh, aside on this: I, I years ago I purchased the E flat contrabass and the B flat contrabass clarinet. Things it was crazy. <laughs> My wife said at the time, "Do you really have to have those? You know, fit in the garage." Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, I played a couple of science fiction movies where I used those. So now I'm leaving those I'm, uh, to the school. I'm leaving them as I'm retiring. That's great. They get to have those instruments and probably my bass and E flat too. I mean, I'm, I just haven't. I want some. I want. I want them to be used. Of course. So I'm, I'm not yeah. going to play them anymore. Right. You know. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, some people might confuse this with my being a nice guy. Actually, I'm just practical. And, and, and I, I, wanna, I want my students to get the jobs. Right. Are my student present, fre present students or my former students? When one of them writes me, I finally got a, 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 a I won't mention names, but I, went, I finally was able to move up and teach at so-and-so junior college. Great. Yeah. Right. They're teaching, they're making money at music. Right. And staying involved. And they're involved. playing the clarinet. So. Right. That's not too bad. No. Now, someone who knows about saxophone and, and of course, as a clarinet uh, uh, teacher and mm -hmm. professional, when you see uh, doublers, mm -hmm. young doublers, uh, and their approach to the clarinet, what are the uh, things you notice that may be lacking a little bit when they're, well, let's control. say, saxophone is control. first? Control. Control. Uh, you know what I mean? If they're used to perhaps doing more. They're just, as far as holding and playing the Mozart Concerto or Brahms Sonata, they just need more stability. And the right setup, right. the right reading mouthpiece. Of course. Yeah. <clears throat> but as far as the embouchure, you notice that they may be a little bit loose or a little They're bit a little not, loose, yeah. Maybe, yeah, not using the teeth that's quite enough. The, you, you understand me. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, in, that's interesting because generally if people don't have the, uh, my perception is if they don't start with the clarinet at first, that it's unusual for them to become truly excellent clarinet players, yeah. Eddie Daniels aside, <laughs> who started yeah. on saxophone. No, well, he's, he's uh, one of my friends. Yeah, yeah. and he, he was a, he's a great player. former great teacher player. of mine, too. So, I mean, but yeah. it's unusual for someone who starts on saxophone to become that proficient on clarinet. You're right, uh, you're right. Because yeah. of that, I think, sometimes. Yeah, he's, so. he's unique. When you were asked to teach at UCLA and you uh -huh. began studying there, I, I imagine you had to devise a curriculum uh, yeah. oh, and so, so what would you recommend today as now with all these years of experience as a, a necessary curriculum for all clarinet players, the clarinet majors coming into college, looking mm -hmm. towards a professional career? What do you think are the essential uh, studies they should work through, repertoire? Close uh, scales, close and thirds, close chords. Uh, and so on. I guess it's just, it's, you know, the simple, simple progress. Long tones when you're first learning, uh, scales, basic scales, slow control. Uh, I don't believe in this placing a finger above the, before you play the note. Have you ever seen that before? Uh, that, yeah, the staggered fingering thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, don't do that. No, no, no. Just, just, just uh, a natural because, way. Doesn't that lend to a little more attention in the fingers? Exactly. To do it? Yeah. No, just, just naturally let the, the, the if you got the rhythm inside you, you know, of the scale or the, the, the thirds or the chords, let that, let that, let that do it, you know. And when, when I breathe, it's really, this is pretty firm. I'm sitting here, you, you know, you think, well, what a nice guy. And, uh, no, when I'm playing, it's like that. Right. So that the diaphragm can be con controlled. Otherwise, you know, if you do this and you're trying to play, now you don't want to look tense to the audience. That's what the main thing is. The audience should feel comfortable with you, with you as a clarinet player. They don't want to hear air leaking. You know, some students do that. Right. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, so and it, sometimes it's in, in learning for an, um, an embouchure, you learn sometimes in order to play steady, and it'll take time for the muscles to, to, to develop. To develop. Yeah, really, yeah. But at a performance situation, or certainly I would imagine, a recording situation where close miking might occur. Yeah, you don't want that. No, and today, no, no. with today, it's unlike it was 50 years ago. Everyone is close miked. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so you can't really afford yeah. to have those extraneous sounds. No, of course not. Right. Of course, that's because the engineer likes to have more control. <laughs> yes, and those things have changed. I imagine <laughs> when you when you first started recording out here in Hollywood, 
they were big orchestras. Oh, of course, yeah. But, and generally, there were mics, a couple of mics well, set over, up in front. In the section. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but There'd you still be a headwind microphone. Right. Yeah. But you still had to project quite oh, oh, and yeah. learn how to yeah. do that. Of course, yeah. Do you see any difference today in, in the clarinetist playing uh, as far as the ability to create resonant sounds and project? Do you see a change in, in the approach? I don't know about that, but I hear some great clarinet playing on movie scores. And from mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I watch a lot of scores or, or movies from England, and I'll hear that slightly loose sound that I think is kind of pretty, you know, in the background. Mm -hmm. And uh, somewhere, you know, the Royal College or Juilliard or UCLA, we're turning out uh, people for the movies. I have a student now, uh, Jonathan, who uh, who wants to, he's already played a movie. Jonathan Sackdelin is his name. And he played uh, this thing that came out um, last year, uh, Mary Poppins or one of those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the he was. Remake. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he's a nice guy. So you can, and he's, he's, he's almost too nice, but uh, he yeah, still comes to study with me. To tell him, tell him the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we study, sometimes we'll just, I'll just have him do sight reading. And I'll say, are you really looking ahead and, and. Right. Uh, well, you know, that's, an, sight reading is something, certainly in the New York area, uh, in, in the freelance orchestras, on the Broadway shows, that has been uh, sort of pushed to the background today because everyone sends their um, scores to you. You get them all over the internet on your yeah, computer. Right, yeah, you print yeah. it out and you practice it beforehand. Uh -huh. And the idea of going into a session and reading it cold and reading it down cold yeah, yeah. is, is, is it's not... Probably, yeah, probably not around that much. Not anymore. around that much anymore. Mm -hmm. Is it still around out here uh, in, this, in the... From I what don't you know? know. I don't know. I, I just... Uh, using Jonathan as an example, he's just so, so uh, conscientious. And he comes back and... and uh, I'm sure he knows about the advantages of, of how to practice uh, in today's world. Yeah. But um, part of it is just having me, I'm sort of his Mitchell Lurie. I see. Mitchell Lurie to me. Right. It's the same thing. Okay. Well, that, that was a great example. Let's talk a little bit about the pedagogy of Mitchell Lurie. What, yeah. what did he emphasize in his teaching? Gosh, just what we've been saying all along. Scales, thirds, uh -huh. chords. Long tones. Was he was he someone who dealt with uh, embouchure and details and placement of the mm, tongue and things like no, that? No, he didn't. He didn't worry about that so much. Tell us a little bit about your the equipment that you've you settled on for the you know uh -huh. most of your career. What mm, what clarinets? Uh, what clarinets? Buffet. Did you play with Arthur. <laughs> I 13? never played. So yeah, our thirteens buffet. I use this mouthpiece. That's a, a copy of Eddie Daniels. The guy in the, uh, in uh, Ohio makes it. Uh, oh, Johnson. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, number three, three and a half, uh, Van Dorn, Blue Box. And this is where it gets boring, folks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but a lot, a lot of the young, young players listening want to hear about okay. this. You know, but that's rather standard. Yeah, uh, it's all equi standard, standard stuff. Standard equipment. Yeah. I don't do anything really exotic. So you were not an equipment fanatic? No, 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 no. Just it. make sure that it's in good shape. And uh... Well, no wonder you're happy. <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> Well, you can drive yourself nuts about it. Oh, no, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's a great world we have of, of the woodwinds of clarinet and saxophone. Right. And uh, I think this is a, a really fantastic idea you've had of us talking about it. I'm sure you've talked to other clarinet saxophone oh, players sure. and uh, yeah, Gary we'll, we'll, and yeah, we'll, Sip. Yeah, well, they're coming in after you, so oh, we're going to be doing that oh, interview right after Gene you. Gene Cipriano, amazing talent. He came to L.A. after the Second World War uh, as a young man and, and uh, noticed there was a lot of uh, players here of f flute, clarinet, bassoon, no oboes. Right. Yeah, he told me that story. Uh, <laughs> and, and, it's, he, and he told me, and, he, and you know, I'm, I'm going to try to get him to talk about it a little bit, yeah. but just as an aside, he told me that for seven years, once they found out he could play oboe, he didn't have a day off and he couldn't get a sub. So he literally, for seven years, never had a day off oh from working God. because oh, uh, he couldn't get a sub, yeah. and, and he was afraid if he turned these people down, he'd yeah, say, well, yeah, all yeah, right, yeah. this guy's not, we'll have yeah, to look for yeah. someone else. But mm. he was literally the first call oboe doubler there I for know, that long I know, without I know. anybody he's, to call on. He's, he's a great player and great tenor saxophone player. Oh. Oh, uh, the best. One of the best ever, mm. and still playing beautifully yeah, at 90 yeah, no, years no, old. Yeah, 90 I, or something, right? I know, right? yeah, absolutely. I, uh, and uh, a 9 -oh. <laughs> that, It's a good number to shoot for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, his thing was, he tells me, some, I wake up in the morning, open my eyes, and 
I, it's another day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have some fun playing and he's got a pool in his backyard. He's yeah. got his ch grandchildren come. And, yeah. Uh, so he's yeah. figured it out. What's wrong? Nothing. Yeah. yeah. So if anyone could take anything away from uh, this interview, I think with you, I think you've made a few really salient points about being totally professional, showing up prepared, yeah. but also having an attitude that uh, is a positive attitude for definitely. those around you and for those in front of you. De definitely. You know, De and, exactly. And, and uh, also doing a wide variety of things, but also you've done something that I've always felt was essential. Uh, you know, it used to be said that if you, if you can't play, you teach. Oh, I that, hate that. I, I hate it too. And, oh. I think that, and I think that's one of the things that has hurt us, has hurt us. Mm. So my feeling is if you can play, you must teach. I, I, please put that in. I, I'm agreeing with you completely. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. You've, but you've lived that way, Gary. So well, thanks, anyway. my friend. Okay. Well, good <laughs> so, to see you. You too. And, 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 and uh, it was, this was fun.